so good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would first like to thank um, Raymond Two Hawks for this opportunity. Um, my name is Mario McLean Jr. Um, I am from Providence, Rhode Island. I am a member of the Wabakwas and Nipmuc tribe. Um, my older brother, Red Spirit, who is the chief of the tribe, he is in attendance today. Um, I am currently the secretary of the American Indian Law Student Association at uh, Roger Williams Law School, which is referred to as ALSA. Um, I am also currently in my final year of law school, so I'll be graduating next month. Um, aside from that, um, I will be facilitating the session today, which will cover the topic of we are the Poconoke. Um, and I just want to apologize up front if I mispronounce any of the tribal names. Um, I know we spoke last night, but again, um, I definitely want to apologize because I don't mean any disrespect. Um, so uh, the way that this is going to go in order is first, um, we will hear from um, the Sagamore. Uh, Po Wampi Neopog of the Poconoke Nation, who will explain the history of the Poconoke Nation. Then this will be followed by the Poconoke Nation tribal historian, Don, who is referred to as Drunk Turtle. Um, he will explain how the Poconoke Nation has survived 400 years since the 1621 treaty signing. And then the closing remarks will be given by the Sachem. Uh, po Pumirpok Anakis, sorry if I mispronounced that, I tried, um, who is referred to as a dancing star. And um, yes, and after this, um, a brief question and answer will be held um, if time allows. Um, and yeah, so now I would love to turn the mic over to the Sagamore and allow you to give your history. Thank you, appreciate that. It, uh, as he said, I am a poor up in the airport. Uh, thunder. Uh, but first, uh, yeah, I'm going to give you a brief uh, overview of uh, the history of our people because they tell me I tend to talk too long. So I'll try and uh, condense this. Uh, first exploits of uh, lands within the uh, ancestral realm of the Poconoco was uh, by uh, Miguel, uh, like a Portuguese. Uh, captain named Miguel Cordillo, and he, he came here in 1502. And then uh, later in 1524, uh, Arizano uh, yeah. came here and uh, he uh, recorded in his captain's log a uh, latitude of 41 degree 40 north would put him parallel to the seat of the Massasoit. And he uh, reported on the uh, people who were here. There were two kings uh, that, that uh, he uh, mentioned uh, in his uh, letter back to the king. And uh, these were the, the Massasoit and his brother Quanaquana, uh, which was also mentioned uh, by uh, Winthrop and, uh, and uh, uh, Governor Carver, who met them, also speaking of the two kings. They were speaking of uh, the uh, Massasoit and uh, Quanaquana and his brother. So it was uh, about 100 years later when the pilgrims uh, came to this area. And of course, this was not the original destination. Um, they were blown off course, ended up in uh, Providence Town. Uh, and of course, the losses uh, ran them out of it because of some things that had happened uh, years earlier uh, when uh, some of the people were taken captive and uh, enslaved and uh, taken to Europe. So the uh, Norse's uh, didn't want them in Providence Town, and uh, they eventually landed in Plymouth uh, at uh, Patuxent Village, uh, which was uh, vacant because the plague had hit our people. And uh, <clears throat> they were there a few months before, uh, before uh, uh, anyone actually contacted them. And uh, this is because uh, it wasn't the fact that we didn't know they were there. The Massasoit had uh, people checking them out all the time. And uh, it was chosen uh, that Samoset, uh, who was a uh, Abenaki uh, Sagamore, and, and uh, of course Abenaki country is up in Maine, but at that time it was Massachusetts, there was no Maine. Uh, he uh, approached the English one day uh, with uh, welcome Englishman. And of course they were surprised that he was someone speaking in their language. Uh, and uh, he uh, told him that he knew someone that spoke the language even better than he did and that he would come back with them. And uh, he came back with uh, the Massasoit, uh, Quanaquena, and a contingent of uh, Pianisi, 
uh, his escort. And uh, of course, uh, from there, uh, they uh, had an agreement amongst them, which you heard earlier. Uh, uh, the treaty, the actual treaty itself, wasn't signed until uh, April of that year. But this was in March, on March 21st, I think it was that uh, they met with uh, Governor Carver at that time in Winthrop, and uh, they went through these uh, formalities. And of course, uh, uh, they handed out the agreement. And then, uh, <clears throat> The uh, the agreement the uh, peace treaty I guess wasn't signed until April, on April first. So this is uh, what we're celebrating the 400 year uh, celebration of the actual signing of the treaty with the Massasoit, according to the Pilgrim Hall uh, Museum. That is what it was called, the uh, treaty with the Massasoit. And of course, uh, when they came here, this area, uh, so most of uh, southeast of Massachusetts, uh, and all the way up to uh, uh, New York State, Catacomb Falls, uh, this side of the Hutchinson River, and uh, uh, southern Vermont, southern New Hampshire, was all uh, uh, Massasoit's uh, uh, territory because he was an uh, acknowledged head of the uh, Quaybar Nipmuc country, also. And uh, you know, if you read the history, you'll find that uh, uh, his son, Warm Sutter, uh, in uh, 1661, he fought Uncas over the Nipmuc. He said an uncle's belonged to him. Uh, and he said that uh, the Nippon belonged to him. And this is why he fought. He said, I fought uncle's over them in uh, 1660 uh, that summer uh, before his father was, uh, before his father died. So basically, uh, the, uh, what eventually uh, what happened is uh, that treaty, uh, which lasted for 54 years uh, because of the, the uh, Massasoit uh, being uh, a man of sincere and honesty, uh, the, the treaty itself uh, was broken by the English more than once. Uh, one, one, one of the uh, breaking of that treaty was uh, when, uh, when they requested for Squanto, Massasoit wanted Squanto turned over to him because in, that, in the terms of that treaty, we were supposed to make out justice to our people and of course, the English were supposed to make out justice to their people. It wouldn't turn Squanto over to the Massasoit. So he actually had a hit in the South on uh, Squanto. He never trusted Squanto to begin with. That's why he had Samoset uh, meet the English. He could have had Squanto meet the English, but there was always a distrust uh, with Squanto. And so uh, that actually, uh, uh, Corbettin actually uh, uh, captured Squanto, was going to put him to death. But before he could, the English. Uh, uh, caught up with, with Corbettin and uh, and uh, uh, Squanto, uh, life was spared, but from that time on, he never strayed anywhere away from that uh, Plymouth plantation. He stayed well within the realm uh, of the English uh, for that protection. And then there was another time when uh, Sassaman, uh, who was the uh, scribe uh, for the uh, King Philip, a lot of the land deals that were going on, the deeds that were signed, uh, uh, they, they were aware that the scribes were forging these forging signatures, forging uh, uh, their uh, uh, not uh, uh, conveying uh, exactly what was involved in those deeds. And so, uh, and, and of course, Sassaman, he also uh, was responsible for uh, uh, leaking to the English that King Philip was uh, preparing for war with them. But the, this is just a couple of instances uh, which, uh, uh, you know, what we can say that the treaty uh, was really uh, 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 violated by the English. Uh, but we kept the peace uh, because we were, we were in a position where uh, because of that plague of uh, uh, 16, uh, 14 to 1619, we needed uh, uh, to uh, have an alliance with the, uh, with the English. Uh, uh, our position had been greatly weakened. Uh, the Massasoit had lost over 90% of its population. He went from a, a tribe of, of 3,000 warriors to under 300 warriors. And yet he was still a uh, proud enough man to take and uh, declare war against anyone that uh, he felt violated or, or dishonored anything that uh, belonged to him. Uh, so eventually, uh, uh, it was King Philip who uh, went to war 
uh, with the English because of the uh, because of the greed of the English for the land, and uh, the man himself uh, was put in a position uh, because when you stop and think about who was groomed to be the master, so it was the elder son Wamsada, and Wamsada was a very proud man, and uh, he was feared by the English because he. Uh, he did not uh, take any uh, uh, backward step. I mean, he was uh, the type that uh, uh, he would fight uh, for what he thought, you know, was right. And basically, he was groomed to be the master. So Philip was actually uh, forced in that position uh, when uh, his son, when his brother, uh, became poisoned uh, by the English uh, uh, at a trip to Plymouth, and which he never returned. So. <laughs> And uh, of course, Philip uh, made the statement to one of his friends uh, that uh, he would he would rather die than be to be without a country. So that King Philip War uh, was all about land and uh, the injustices that were done to uh, his people. And so basically, uh, when he was killed, he was killed right here on the other side of the bridge in, uh, in uh, Mount Hope, uh, which we call Montauk. Uh, which is one of the primary villages uh, for, for the uh, Massasoit uh, Philip or Metacomet. They, uh, they quartered his body, they beheaded him. Uh, there's a memorial up there on, on the heifer the side of that property where he was killed. And they took his surroundings and they put them on a reservation in Chautauqua. And the uh, people that they put on a reservation in Chautauqua were. Uh, his war captain, his sister, and his cousin. Uh, these were uh, mostly uh, his relatives that they captured. The ones that got away were uh, with Anawan. Anawan, who was the uh, head by an easy warrior for the uh, master son of Osamiqua, who walked with him and uh, signed that peace treaty. And he was also the head by an easy warrior for Omerikan. <clears throat> Excuse me. A Palmetto Comet was uh, was uh, Anawan's nephew uh, because Anawan was married to the uh, Master Soyosa Beacon's sister. So the I'm losing my train of mind. <laughs> you have to forgive me. Um, so uh, the like as I was saying, Anawan escaped. From uh, uh, Mount Hope when they when they killed Philip, and uh, he ended up over in uh, at Hanawan Rock and uh, and what they call Rehoboth, uh, which was part of, which was Seagog at that time, uh, and uh, actually he was uh, captured over there by Benjamin Church. Uh, he was in his eighties at the time, and. Uh, Benjamin Church was calling up to Boston uh, to court there for some business. Anawan uh, was not supposed to be killed. He was in his 80s and they beheaded him. They beheaded most of it. They beheaded uh, Obamacom. They quartered his body. They gave his uh, hands to different chiefs, so forth and so on. Uh, and uh, that's what they did to the chiefs in the uh, Okanokan uh, nation. Uh, animals beheaded. Uh, Rita Wu, the sports agent of the uh, Cassie Drive, she was beheaded. And uh, Tatusaquin. Tatusaquin uh, was the uh, black agent who was married to uh, Amy, who was Philip's sister. He was beheaded. So most of our chiefs that they uh, captured were beheaded. <laughs> the people of my Okanokan uh, nation, because at that time when the English came here, this, this area was known as the Okanokan Confederacy or the Okanokan nation, and then later they <laughs> became the uh, King Philip uh, country. Any map prior to the King Philip War, including the uh, John Summers map, was not made to the King of England. And the uh, Gookins map of that period. And then the uh, Smithsonian Handbook uh, uh, of North American Indians, I think it's a volume 15. They all say the same thing. Open over country, 
and then uh, or later on King Philip country. So there's, this is something that has been acknowledged by some and the, the uh, evidence is in the repositories of the uh, Ivy League universities, uh, Yale, Brown, Harvard. This information uh, until the uh, age of the uh, until the age of the internet was uh, not well known. One of the things that uh, was passed down in our, in our family was the fact that uh, uh, when we were, uh, when Philip was killed and they took our people up to uh, the Chautauqua Reservation, they put an overseer over, over us. And uh, it was the Reverend Fitch. And uh, the Reverend Fitch was taken away from us and they put Uncas uh, as the overseer. And Uncas was uh, raping a uh, woman and then uh, he was uh, killing our old man. And so it got to the point where we kept coming down the river, we ended up in the Groton, New London area. And it was there that they, uh, that, uh, they settled uh, the, the captors of uh, the uh, of the uh, King Philip uh, family. Uh, but the Anawan captains, who was the other side of the uh, family there, they were over there in a Rehoboth. Uh, uh, and as a kid, I always remember my grandmother was on my father's side. Uh, Anawan was on my father's side uh, 10 generations, uh, great grandfather. And uh, my grandmother, who was born in 1870, Eight, they have her birthday, uh, but they said that at the time she was probably about three, two, three or four years old when she came in. She was very small for her age, and uh, she always told me, "You, you know where the water rock is?" And I said, "Yes, but I know what I said." My people come from Anawan, you know, and uh, in in eighteen twelve, when the town of Seacon incorporated. There was three Indian villages there. These were, these were the, uh, the Altica family. This is what they call them the Sequan tribe today. They couldn't call them Poconoka because it was against the law. Because during the King Philip War, the colonial government made a law you know, that made it illegal for you to say that you were Poconoka if you were male 14 years of age or over under penalty of death. So they could kill you or they would kill you. And so when they incorporated this tribe, they knew they were the Anawan captives, the remains of the Anawan captives, the three villages. They called them the Seekonk Indians. This was in 1812. So my, my grandmother's people, they were there. They built the church over there on the corner of Chestnut Tree. Uh, they put their nickels there because this is the only way that they could conjugate in those days was in the church. And uh, when they did this, uh, her family, they built this, uh, the church is standing there to this day. These are the remains of the Okanoga tribe on that side. And the other side, uh, uh, the, the people that come from Griswold and uh, New London area, this is my mother's side of the family. They come directly from King Philip's line. And of course, when, uh, when uh, George Washington came to Patchor to take over the revolutionary forces. He stopped in this uh, in there, and uh, there was this man out there who was wrestling with all of his soldiers and pinning his men. And he called him and he wanted to know who he was. And uh, he told him, My line is a, a dead book. He couldn't speak about it. But he had the insignia of the Open Open Tribe, which is the the Star of Seven Crescent. So before there was a woman, uh, there was, this is where he showed the George Washington. And this story is in the, uh, the history of the town of Griswold. Uh, he went with them that day and became a continental soldier, received a pension from the United States government. Uh, of course, uh, in my family, in my family history, I have his discharge papers and uh, the pension that he received. Uh, Sylvia Simons, uh, the one thing they noted about him is that he was a full blooded Wampanoag Indian. They couldn't call him Popanoke. They called him Wampanoag. He was the great grandson of King Philip. So this is how my mother's family life came down. So basically, uh, I've been working, uh, trying to uh, 
help my people to become uh, independent, but discovered that in the process that uh, becoming fairly recognized wasn't the way that we wanted to go. And so I'm trying to shorten this up because I, I can be belong or I can tell you about history. But, uh, so in 2013, uh, we started discovering that there were a lot of uh, laws out there that applied to Aboriginal inhabitants of the land, which is what I am. I'm the original uh, inhabitant of this land. And that we didn't need federal recognition, that these laws were actually written for the Aboriginals. And if you read a lot of these laws, you'll see they'll talk about the American Indian or the American Aborigine, and they'll talk about the Alaska Native, and they'll talk about the Native American. So I'm not going to go and tell you, explain why all of that is, but when they talk about the Aboriginal inhabitants of the land, they're talking about Article 3 of the Constitution of the United States, and this is where all of our uh, laws are written for people that are not fairly recognized. So that we discovered that we didn't need federal recognition to be eligible for the things that uh, the fairly recognized tribes would get because we were entitled to the same thing. Because before there were federally recognized tribes, there was a constitution of the United States. Because don't forget, before the West was won, it was New England. This is where it all started, here and in Jamestown, uh, Virginia. And so we, uh, we studied these laws as a uh, uh, troop farm, and we discovered that, uh, these laws apply to our people. We want our people to be uh, self-sufficient. Uh, they've uh, done a lot of injustices to our people. We're going to use these laws, their laws, to get our rights. And so basically in 2013, we started this process, putting our, our people back in their proper perspective as far as this uh, this uh, uh, Aboriginal inhabited uh, uh, process is concerned. And uh, there's, there are a lot of uh, things that we had to do in order to uh, reclaim, reclaim our uh, Aboriginal rights, uh, repay, repatiate our people back into our trusts and uh, things of this nature, because this government is a trust. Well, I, I don't want to go into all of this, but I'm just going to take and uh, I'm going to leave it right there, but tell you that in 2015, what I did is I just determined at that time that I was going to take back the name which we were before they start calling us Wampanoag. Because Wampanoag is a term that uh, came about during the King Philip War, 1675, 1676. And that's because they outlawed the word uh, Poconoke. And so when I took back the term uh, of the Pocono Nation, the Pocono Confederacy, whatever you want to call it, that put us in our proper perspective with the United States government. Because Wampanoag is a term that they use, and they deal with you on their terms. When you use Pocono Nation, Pocono uh, Confederacy, then, then they're dealing with you on our terms. And that goes back to the crown. All of maritime laws, all of these things go back to the crown, and there's no denying uh, who we are. We know who we are. Uh, it's been drilled in my head from the time I was a kid. There were times uh, when I've talked about it that I was called in the house because they were afraid, they feared for my life back in the 40s when I bragged to people, well, I, you know, I was just a kid. I'm a descendant of King Well, this was drilled in my head from the time that I, that I could talk. I knew who I was. And so uh, I, I bring it uh, to this to this day. Uh, I can tell you that coming up, both sides of my family, I always knew who I was. And in order, in order, to, you need to know who you are in order to accomplish things in, in this. Thing. So I'm just going to leave it there. You know, I think that's um, a good segue to what Don uh, will be talking about. Um, that we could not identify ourselves um, by who we were. 
by who we knew we were, it, it was outlawed that you could not call yourself Poconoke. And um, the Poconoke people, um, you know, we were killed, we were sold as slaves, we were scattered, we had to, you know, hide for fear of your lives. And, you know, when you see um, your, your relatives, your kinfolk um, being killed before your eyes and, you know, and, and they say, don't call yourself Pope Pinocchio, or this will happen to you. Well, then you don't, you don't call yourself by Pope Pinocchio because it's a matter of survival. And, um, you know, a lot of, um, you know, a lot of us did, you know, take on the word um, Wampanoag. And I have to say that um, it was very healing um, when, you know, Sagamore's generation did come out and say, no, we're not going to do that. We are not going to be called Wampanoag anymore. We are Poconoke and we're going to come forward and we are going to, you know, reclaim. We're going to identify as who we are. And that, that um, was very healing. And that is where, you know, we are and where we need to be. And, you know, we, we're not going to let the colonizers tell us who we are. And we're not going to let other people tell our story. And there are many stories of the journey of our people. Um, and I, I thank you for, you know, for sharing that. And, um, you know, Don, I, I think we're going to hand it over to you. And I, I, I did want to say one more thing. We should probably back up. I noticed a lot of new people have um, come on since we initially started this morning. And I just want to back up and say welcome. Um, we greet you. We welcome you to um, Solomons, to the land of the Poconoket. Um, we are honored you know, that you're here, that you took time out of your schedule, you know, to be here and to hear our story. Um, you know, I, you know, just want to thank the creator for the gift of being here today, for opening our eyes, for being here, for, you know, the gift of life, for wisdom, for our ancestors, our elders, and for all of our relations. And I just want to pass it on to you. Yes, thank you. So when we're talking about um, this legacy of who the Poconoke people are, um, all too often it, historians are starting to acknowledge who the Poconoke people were. We stopped at 1675, and there's not enough conversation in the public about what happened since then, hundreds of years, of how did not just the Poconoke people, but indigenous people in general maintain their identity because Going throughout US history, we were no exception to racism, to land them, to the idea of disenfranchisement, the idea of just trying to survive and hold on to who and what we are, and trying to confront even stereotypes of what it meant to be. And so there has been a continuing effort by each generation because our history is a oral history, it's passed on from one generation to the other. And that's how we kept our traditions in the family because. After the King Philip's War, a political entity such as the Poconoke people ceased to exist. Those of us who were around, as the Sagamore always said, most of our leaders were killed. The English were well aware of who the leaders were in the region. They were killed. Old Samequin's <clears throat> grandson, Meetom, that is um, King Philip's son, and his mother was sold into slavery into Bermuda, as were many of the natives who fought against the English because uh, Governor Winthrop had a correspondence with not just the uh, Bermuda of Barbados, but in the Caribbean, they had correspondence and many of our people were sold there to help pay off for the debt and all the damages done during the war of 1675. Likewise, those of us who were, will remain, yes, his relations were sent to the Shintucket Reservation under guard, under Reverend Fitch, which was later on under Uncas, who was one of our rivals and some would say um, our enemy. But many of other people had to flee. They fled north into Abenaki country, or they had to assimilate with the other tribes there just to survive. The histories of what our families would have to go through, the name Poconoke was something that was whispered. It wasn't welcomed, and that's something I think in contemporary. When we think about all too often, when we talk about history, we think of it from a contemporary perspective. And we don't understand that, not just in 1675, but 
in the 1700s and 1800s and early 1900s, it wasn't very popular to say you were indigenous, let alone Poconopia. This was a life or threat death situation. Some of our family members did not tell their children. And putting myself into their shoes, I can understand that struggle when you're just trying to survive and people are discriminating you based on your appearance and how you look and how well you speak English. You're not gonna tell your children what's going on in the struggle that you would tell your children who you are. And the biggest struggle we have today with this upcoming generation is that not so much that we're Poconoke, but that other people are trying to take our voice from us and say, we are not who we claim we are. And our struggle is in the history books. It's in the universities. It's saying that, yes, the Poconoke are here. We've always been here and we're the children right at you. And so this idea of trying to hold on to our identity and hold on to our name and not let anyone take it from us. And it's been an ongoing thing. And that's really been the struggle that not just the Sagmo has taken up the generations that came before him and going on to where we are right now of the struggle of how do we maintain our identity in a society where we were forced to assimilate into to survive? And dealing with this upcoming thing and how open we are that now our story hasn't changed, but now the idea is that we have the public is more willing to listen, whether it be through different education institutions, through technology, that this information is more accessible. But our story hasn't changed at all. It's just that what has changed is people's hearts and people are willing to listen to our story. And in order to know where we're coming from, we have to know where we are right now. And going back to this treaty of 1621, it's been 200 years. It's a learning lesson because the ideals of that treaty and how it's actually applied to that generation of um, English colonists in the Poconoke who were there was very different. The ideals of that treaty have learned to coexist together, to value each other, and to live together. Those are great ideals, but in application, it didn't work out. And we have another chance again going forward 400 years later to really live up to the ideals we have of acknowledging each other's history, knowing where we come from, learn to live in peace and cooperation with each other. And conversations like these is part of that process to not just have ideals, but live in them, not just during this conference, but after them and moving forward. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm, I'm not sure where we are in terms of time. I can't, <laughs> I can't see. Um, and I, I don't want us to go to go over. We're until 1.30. 1.45. 1.45 plenty of time. Okay. Um, I don't talk much. I'm a storyteller. If you want me to tell stories, I can talk all day. <laughs> but I'll leave most of um, the talking to um you know, Sagamore, um, because of his being an elder and the knowledge um, that he has, he's, you know, a, a keeper, um, you know, of our culture and, and knowledge. And, you know, that, that gap from, you know, when we couldn't say um, and really identify who we were to now when, you know, when we can. And, and, you know, what he has to say is very important, as well as what our historian has to say. Um, but, you know, what, what I would, would just like to say is, you know, we are here in, it's 400 years after the treaty of 1621 with the Massasoit and the Pilgrims. And that can be a very controversial subject. To this day, many indigenous people say that was the beginning of the end. You know, that, that time period, you know, just nothing was the same since then. And, you know, and, and, you know, we should have never signed it. It should have never happened. There's, you know, a lot of hurt 400 years later. I don't know what the outcomes would have been if anything had happened any differently. But I do know that the Massasoit Osamequin, he did enter into this treaty and he did what he thought was best at the time with the knowledge he had and the circumstances surrounded him and he put himself in a position of strength for the benefit of his people and that is an honorable thing he entered into this treaty and as you said it was a treaty of 
mutual respect. And had it been honored, two different cultures could have coexisted together. But we all know that did not happen. I do know that the Massasoit Osmeguin was honorable and he did not break the treaty on his behalf, on his part. He stayed true to what he said he was going to do. And he went through great lengths to keep peace in light of the infraction <laughs> from the other party. And he did keep peace until his death. So here we are 400 years later, and what do we do now? We can't go back in time. What do we do now 400 years later after the signing of this treaty? Well, I think we should honor the treaty. I think that the truth needs to be acknowledged and the truth needs to be told. Reconciliation needs to happen and it needs to happen starting here and now 400 years after the original signing of that treaty. Yeah, before you can have reconciliation, the people have to acknowledge that they did something wrong. And they haven't done that up here in the Northeast of Colorado. They've done that out West. They haven't done it up here. Uh, it's like you're an invisible people. Uh, if you're not fairly recognized, uh, but my people, my family, even today, I, there's a couple of books out now that uh, Providence, I think you've probably seen it, they talk about my family and, and the books. I know I'm going back to the, uh, and I didn't do this right. I didn't put my family in his history. I didn't put my family's uh, history in the government, in, in the government, Smithsonian and so forth and so on. The government did that. My family's, uh, the, the, the go back to 1735 on the Wheaton side, as Toby Wheaton, my great grandfather, uh, was an Indian slave. They have these records in Newport, uh, Indian servant. Uh, that's Wheaton side. Uh, they have a uh, uh, Simeon side. When I came up in Providence, uh, I didn't tell people, I didn't have to tell people I was in there. They all knew my people, they knew both sides of my family. Oh, you're the guy. Oh, yeah, you're so and so's kid. Oh, they're Indian. Uh, so I didn't have to go around. A lot of people, I couldn't deny what I was because they knew my family. And then the church that we went to, uh, and that's how we assimilated uh, uh, in the church. That's how we could get together. And, and Pond Street, uh, Second Free Will Baptist, Pond Street Church at that time was the Second Free Will Baptist Church. It's a bunch of Indians out there. And my grandfather was a deacon in that church, and my grandmother a deaconess. And my uh, Uncle Fred went to that church, and he was the uh, he was a treasurer of the Algonquin Indian Council when it first started. He died in uh, 1926. And they, you know, they had that information in the papers. In 17, uh, in 1976, they had my mother's family to the town of Griswold, uh, 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 Connecticut, uh, to honor them uh, uh, because of Simeon Simons, uh, their great grandfather. Uh, they honored him because he was put on the uh, bicentennial coin in the town of Griswold, Connecticut. And uh, there's also a portrait of him in the uh, Griswold Town Hall, him and George Washington. And on that coin is the seal of Griswold, and on the other side is uh, uh, George Washington and Simeon Simons riding horseback. But they honored uh, my mother's family, so the Wheaton and the Simon line were there because they they all grew up in that village and they and they kept their line strong. And, uh, and uh, uh, I remember my uh, great uncle Frank. My mother's uncle, uh, when President Eisenhower was uh, president, they wrote a letter to him and they wanted him to lead the Columbus Day Parade because he was the last full blooded Indian in the state of Rhode Island. But this was President Eisenhower. These are things that have happened in my family. Uh, so I never, you know, some people have a problem with, uh, saying who they are or, or being recognized for who they are, but I never had that, I never had that problem. But my problem was I couldn't say I was spoken over. Even Princess Redwing, my mother's first cousin, because a lot of people don't know this. People that will sit there, they'll say, oh, he's, he's not who we say it. But they know who Princess Redwing is. Well, Princess Redwing's parents and my mother's parents were the, were the same. They were brothers and sisters, their parents. So basically, uh, they know who she is. They know that she's been honored. She's in the uh, Rhode Island Heritage Hall of Fame since uh, 1978. 
uh, King Philip, when he went in, in 1997, they had my cousin Willie Green, who was an elegant chief of the Seacons, to accept that uh, that award when they when, uh, when they inducted uh, King Philip in, in 1997. And then Rosa Mika was, I think, in, in the year 2000. So in all this history that's going on through the years, and you'll have people out there telling you that you don't know who you are. I, I know my, my parents made it crystal clear to me who I was. Appreciate <laughs> what they did with your parents, mm -hmm. they, how they tried to oh, yeah. for genocide. I, oh, yeah. They, they, I've, I've, got, um, I've got certificates here of my mother, my parents getting married uh, in Fall River. Uh, I went to uh, get the, uh, a copy of their uh, marriage certificate. These are the things that they, they've done. And uh, they give me this certificate. And I, I said, that's not, my, that's not a copy of my parents' uh, marriage certificate. They said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, my, on my parents' marriage certificate, it says my mother's in the end. It says my father's in the end. This is in 1932. So they said, oh, no, sir, we, we don't do that. So I, I have the certificate right here. I showed them and said, where would you get that? This is my parents' marriage certificate. <laughs> out of a four river. They said, oh, sir, they, went, they had those cabins, all these books for every year up to that year. And uh, that that year was not on, on the cabins. And she came back to me. She said, well, sir, she says, uh, that book is the only one that's not here. It's in the city solicitor's vault. She said, I have to get permission to get that. If you come back after lunch, I'll give you a copy of your parents' certificate. But they were going to give me a thing. They're just wiping out the Indians because they don't want to have a record of the fact of who you are. And so I came back after lunch. And I got a copy. I'll show you. I'll show this to you. I got it on it here. I can't show it on the screen. But what happened was uh, they gave me that. They gave me that uh, certificate, and they had on it my father's in there, my mother's in there. And she asked for the other certificate back. I told her, "Oh man, I left that in the car. That's like four blocks up the road. I don't even want that." So she told me, "You can keep it." But these are the things they did: the paper genocide. I mean, I had problems uh, even with my kids. One was Indian, one's white. I said, what's, what's, <laughs> and when she went to get her, her uh, driver's, license. driver's license, when she was 16 years of age, I had to go over the records right next, right next to the motor vehicle uh, across from the state house. They had corrected it all. They corrected it, but they argued with me. They put down what they want to put down on her. And my daughter's Indian. They don't care what you say. They'll put down what they want. When I went to get her a certificate for her, for her license, they they corrected it, Indian. So what happened? Well, they got your grandfather's Indian, your father's Indian, your mother's Indian, you're Indian. So she's got to be Indian. But but you try to get them to write that down, uh, you know, at City Hall. They they'll wipe you off, wipe all, all your family history, you know. And this is and, and this we're, we're fortunate that we have that paper trail. Yeah. And you know, my my heart. Um, breaks and I sympathize with those who don't because it, it's not easy and ours is an oral history and what has happened to our people it's been just 400 years of trying to brainwash you um, mm -hmm. that you're not who you say you are or who your um, ancestors told you um, you know that you are and you know don't don't give up the fight don't give up the search um, you know, don't, um, you know, get crushed under the power of colonization. Did you want to talk on that with your students? Um, absolutely. I mean, especially in Rhode Island, many um, people, not just Pocono, but just people are just misclassified. Um, going back, just going back to um, English uh, colonial history, the English wanted to separate themselves from how the Spanish treated the indigenous people there especially um, the pious uh, Puritan separatists wouldn't even really use the term slave, they would say indentured servant. And so many indigenous people here were categorized as indentured servants who couldn't leave and couldn't marry without permission. And it sounds a lot like slaves, it was slavery. And, um, and they had to take on English names. And um, as before, it seems unnecessary that we have to go out of our way and just as the side one says, our family is so documented, but we still have to go out of our way mm -hmm. to prove who we are. 
And so a lot of people can go back to the idea of indentured servitude. It's like, I, or even with um, students, because I teach young people, they tell me, you know, Mr. I'm indigenous, but I'm, that's all I know. And there's so much more than that, more than that because of this idea of other people writing your history and telling your story. And we're all, this idea of do not let people tell your story. You must know who you are. Ask your parents, ask those who take care of you where you're coming from. Do not let someone else take that narrative from mm -hmm. you because there's power in that narrative. Mm -hmm. And this idea, this drumbeat that we have that we are Pocanoke. All right, there's all saying going back to Anwang, it goes a it means oh, stand firm. And we are standing firm in our heritage and who we are. We are not gonna let other people try to tell us who we are, not just for us, but for generations to come. So mm -hmm. the new generations that are being born, the young people right now, do not be afraid to identify who you are. Talk about your family history. You are a Pocono kid. Tell you about your parents. Tell your tribal history. And it's not just Pocono kid. You're near against it or, <laughs> or you're from Massachusetts. Let them know who you are. Do not be afraid to tell your teacher when they have heritage, much of cultural day that, yeah, you're talking about my people. Because mm -hmm. I experienced that as a child in school. We were talking about we're extinct like dinosaurs. There's no Indians here. And I raised my hand. It's like, <laughs> you're not really an Indian. I was like, <laughs> No, that's not true, but you have to have ownership in that. And that's really this revival that we're trying to take right now. And it's a, it's a process because we have to um, go across modern stereotypes of this idea because we like to make these generalizations of um, all the indigenous people. If you are indigenous, you must live on a reservation. And so that's not the case. You know, you're a human being like anywhere else. You can have a public or private sector job. You can start a business. You can work with your people. If you want to be more independent, do your own thing, but still keep ties with your family. You can do that like anyone else. Mm -hmm. You know, and this is just me because I work with young people, especially young people with indigenous ancestry. This is kind of ambiguous because they're not sure where to stand, especially when they have to go, when they have uh, SATs, they have to categorize what class you belong to, they can, they can write there's really not a lot of space for them to write who they are. And they feel like they have to lie, they just hit others and then they just get crossed over. And that's how people's, and that it might seem like a minor thing, but that's how people's heritage gets lost. And this is why we're trying to, what we have today is what was passed down to us and we stop passing, and we stop telling people who we are. We stop telling the children after us who we are. Then we disappear completely. You no know, conquest has the two phases. There's a physical conquest, but there's a psychological conquest as well. When you submit to the ideas and accusations of those who um, are over you, when you accept their ideas as truth and being your own, and it's confronting that history, and that is what was passionate about. When we talk about who the Pocahontas people are, we've always been here, and we're reclaiming that heritage, and we're going back to the future generations too. I have a daughter, and from when she goes to school one day and all her cousins, because um, all her little cousins who are one, two, three years old, that whole expansion family, my vision for them, when they grow up one day, they're not gonna have to worry about this. They can say they're Pocanoke, all this gets to see what tribe, what people come from. No one's gonna question, no one's gonna challenge it. It's not gonna be this old thing, oh, show me your blood count. Well, what is that? <laughs> we have to go back to our families and that you should matter, you have a tied to this land, and that's why families are so important here too. When you talk about the indigenous people, Pokemon people, you have to talk about the families and where they've been. All right. We went, we were in Connecticut for a hundred years in Griswold, Connecticut, and then uh, going back to my great grandmother's generation, Esther Reed, and they came to Providence, Rhode Island. Okay. And, um, and if you go back into Providence, Rhode Island, we talk about that, that identity classification and then my mother going to uh, Warwick. It doesn't fit the stereotype of what most Americans think um, um, of indigenous people. This idea of uh, this fluid transition that we can have jobs, we can have education. So we have to really claim that history and be there for all of us. So this is, this is an ongoing struggle. It's not going to end here. It's not going to end with me. This is an ongoing thing that every generation has to revive to say that we know who you are and don't let other people take that story from you. And that's really what it means to be a Pocanoke of Utah. We stand yeah. firm. We know where we are. That's, that's, that's one of the problems is other people are writing about you. Those books are problem. They didn't interview. They, I'm still here. They're talking about my mother and father. They didn't interview me, my brothers, all my, we're still here. You know, they talk, 
you know, he talked about things from their perspective, talked about, you know, well, for instance, uh, uh, they didn't mention that uh, that the guy, my brother, uh, was christened in 1936, and that's the first time that the government came to the powwow in Narragansett because of my brother, because my my people were all working down at the state house at the turn of the century. And he was christened was, by Princess <laughs> Redwing, who was his godmother. Brother, that's his godmother. Princess Redwing is my, my brother's godmother. I mean, that wasn't mentioned in that book at all. And then they mentioned, well, I, I don't want to go, but, and, but, and, and, but even, even if they talk about Master Khan, my brother was born on Calhoun Avenue in the house in Master Khan area. You know, yeah. I've lived in Master Khan area before. <laughs> and you know, that, that's where Dr. Carrington was mm -hmm. talking about ethics, yeah. mm -hmm. um, you know, in, you know, so, history and yeah. historical review. That's what, that's what I want and to I, And I appreciate that. Yeah. They, I, they I appreciate what you so were I mean, saying. So here we are, we're still here. Who are the Pocahontas? Well, has anybody come to us and ask us, well, who are you? You know, we'll tell you who we are. We've <laughs> been here all the time. But my parents made it crystal clear to me. <laughs> I, I think we're just about out of time. Thank you. Are, are we all set? I think, uh, first of all, a round of applause for our Boganoka family. And I do believe that Mr. McLean has a few questions that he wants to pose from the chat and maybe from himself as well. And, and I do want to say we are family, which is why we're closer than six feet without masks. <laughs> <laughs> Just want to make that clear. We want everyone to be safe. Yeah, we're, we're, a, being we're a multi generation, <laughs> four generations. All right. All right. Um, so uh, the first question that we got is from um, Dave or Sarah Reed. And this is for Love Sagamore. And the question is uh, to begin reconciliation, who should who do you believe should make a public statement um, to in, in regards of the Poconokans, which you said that they were treated wrongly after the war? Do you believe that the governors or the legislature should make these public comp, public statements? Yes, uh, uh, the governor, the governor should uh, make a public statement, uh, and also uh, this United States government should be making a statement. Uh, the the uh, that should come right down uh, from. Because the authority uh, over the Aboriginal American uh, lies with Congress. It doesn't lie. It doesn't lie with the uh, the uh, the uh, courts. For instance, if uh, if I go to court, I sit in an Article Three court with three Article Three judges. If you go to court and, and you're not a, uh, an Aboriginal American, you sit before a jury of your peers, twelve people. I sit before three Article Three judges. There are only two Article th uh, Three courts in the United States. One is in Washington, the other one is in Hawaii. So in order for you to be tried in Hawaii, they have to send judges to Hawaii, Article Three judges to Hawaii. So that's, you know, that's gonna come from the top right on down. For years, we've been uh, just ignored. Uh, it's called denial by delay. And I've been telling you people this for the longest time. They just don't, they just, don't answer you. They just, and so it's called denial by delay. We, uh, we've we never had an audience uh, with the governor. We tried uh, to get an audience with the governor. Uh, we met with her people. <laughs> we couldn't get an audience with the, uh, the Supreme Court justice here in, in the state of uh, Rhode Island. We sent out letters to these people, never even uh, answered us. So, I mean, these, these are the things that go on. They just ignore you. You know, so it's, it needs to come from the top down and they need to acknowledge that they did something wrong up here because they just took this land from us. The way that the land uh, was taken from uh, King Philip, uh, it was called a uh, surf, uh, what do they call it? Surf, uh, twig, twig, <laughs> twig and surf ceremony. They just picked up, uh, I broke a, a twig from the nearest branch, picked up a clog of dirt and then they gave it, and that's how you got the land. That's how the land was transferred. And the land was not transferred. Now that war was over in, well, they say 1678, but King Philip was killed in 1676. The land was not transferred until they got all the King Philip relatives out of, out of Bristol, uh, Rhode Island. Then they took and they transferred that land and they, they gave it as a consortium, a consortium, a consortium of Wally, a Lynch, there were three of them out of Boston. And, uh, 
1679. This is three years after the war, and they didn't name it person Harvey until 1680. Yeah, they yeah. bought name. That's that's what Bruce is about to say. Oh, okay, go ahead. Okay. Perfect. Um, thank you for your answer, Sagamore. Um, so the next question is from Marie. Um, and it says, were many tribes adopted? Because I have I have all of these so-called um, Narragansett ancestors, but they stemmed from several tribes. Is there any information on that? We, we can't talk to the Narragansett. Well, I can't speak to the Narragansett, but I can tell you that, uh, <laughs> that uh, the uh, Poconoke Nation, when the English come here, was one of the largest uh, Indian nations uh, in colonial, post-colonial uh, uh, America, if you want to call it. Mm -hmm. There were over 60 tribes, bands, and clans. So that a lot of people have lost their identity as far as what tribe they belong to because the tribes are extinct today. They don't know. This history was a past off. So basically, uh, one of the things that we have done, even in uh, our constitution, is to say that if you can prove that you're a Poconoke and we and or Wampanoag, uh, because that term Wampanoag was a term that was uh, reserved for the tribes before uh, with uh, Philip against the English. If you can prove that you're a uh, Wampanoag because we were the headship tribe of that nation, because when they spoke of the Massasoit, they spoke of the Massasoit who lived in Poconoke, who, uh, who lived in Seoul. The Poconokes lived in Seoul. They called Metacomet Poland which means Metacoma of Poconoke. And this is uh, the reference uh, that there was a Poconoke tribe. And that was the headship of the nation. So we take in anyone that can prove that they come from Walmart or the Senate. We don't push the Poconoke out of them. We are Poconoke. We're not Walmart. Perfect. Um, so the next question I'm actually going to ask myself. Um, so... <laughs> <laughs> So um, I was just curious to if, well, if you could explain just, um, you know, uh, the way that your tribe set up and just um, more or less give a little bit more um, elaboration on your clans and just some of the background. Mm -hmm. well, we have certain family lines that are in the Poconoke tribe, um, and we do have sachems from each family line, um, you know, within our tribe. And uh, we, we have five clans, uh, the, uh, the bear, the deer, the wolf, the slave, the turtle clans, yeah. uh, you know, depending on, uh, you know, what, uh, what your expertise is, uh, that would determine, you know, which clan you would be in. That is something that they would observe, uh, you and then okay. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry. <laughs> I don't know. I, you look like you froze. Me too. He's frozen. Oh, okay. All right. You're also okay. He's frozen. Is, is someone asking a question? Sorry. <laughs> you could I'm sorry, we can't hear you. Was there someone asking a question? No. Oh, all right. Sorry, I thought I heard someone talking. <laughs> um. So I don't see any other questions here. Um. So um, if there's like any you know closing remarks that um either of you want to add or um if you want to address anything that you haven't already talked about um feel free to do that now. <laughs> Um, I've done enough. I, you know, as as I said, um, it's 400 years later. Reconciliation begins now. Let's make right what happened. Let's speak the truth. Let's acknowledge the truth. Let's begin to heal the hurt of our people and. Let's honor that tree. You know, 
And the final words is uh, thank you for everyone again for giving us an opportunity just to hear our voice. And the idea that the Poconoke people, we have been here, we will always be here. This is some of our, our land. And we're here again for rebuild and reconciliation. I think 400 years ago <laughs> is a missed opportunity, one that we can follow not just in words, but in actions in every day and how we live. And like we say, peace be with you, Aquani. Thank you for your time and a home. Uh -huh. uh, the is alive and well. And as, uh, as Anna won, uh, Ted Pinesi Warrior was here during the King Philip War, uh, giving the war cry, Ayutas, Ayutas, stand firm, stand firm and fight. Thank you. Um, I, I would like to say thank you to everybody. Oh, no, please not leave where you're at. Now, can we have a round of applause for your name as well? We're going to hand out a bit, and our Poconoke family don't leave yet. We have a special presentation from Principal Chief Yanaguska. Chief, please. Sagamore, I have great respect for you. Dancing star, congratulations on being chief. Um, we in Loki, have created some gifts for you in commemoration of this 400 year event. We're honored to be able to present them to you if you don't mind. This is for you, Sagamore. And this is for you, Chief Dancing Star, so that you'll think fondly of your brothers to the south. And we really, really thank you for the centuries of leadership and bravery that your people have shown. And our peoples have been in each other's paths for centuries. And we're honored to have such great leadership to the north. And we look forward to working for generations to come. And blessings upon your house and your people. Thank you. Thank you. And please don't go anywhere. Round of applause for Chief Yana Kuzco. He finally read something as well on behalf of the American Indian Law Students Association at Rajun University School of Law. Thank you, Quay. And this is a greetings and good day, Naino. And uh, on behalf of the American Indian Law Student Association at Roger Williams School of Law, we'd like to thank all of you, especially you, Sagamore, working closely with you over this years uh, as Tainos, we have always been here and we are often told we don't exist. Our, to our stories are told without us. Um, and so in the name of reclaiming our, our lands, our, our names, our language, our culture, uh, we want to say thank you and our own Seneca Kakona, which means thank you and abundant blessings. Uh, so we have a couple of applause, please.